I call this presentation Through the Looking Glass, which many of you will know is the title of the 19th century book by Lewis Carroll that describes the adventures of Alice, who enters through a looking glass, what we would now call a mirror, into a strange and wonderful world of mythical creatures and events. In much the same way, the microscope for me and for many others has been the way we have entered the wonderful world of microscopic objects and phenomena. Here's a photograph of me taken when I was about 14, looking through my real microscope, not a toy one. This was the middle of the Second World War, and I was fortunate not only to be too young to be drafted, but to have resourceful parents who were able to find and purchase this instrument for me. I had spent many hours looking through the microscope, preparing specimens for observation, reading about the things that I was observing, and becoming a scientist on my own. I think one of the greatest things about this experience was the independence that it fostered. If I wanted to know something, I had to either find it out myself or read about it in one of the books my parents were able to provide for me. Skipping ahead a number of years to the time I entered graduate school in the old zoology department at Yale, my advisor, Donald Polson, was a Drosophila geneticist, and for a long time, I thought I would do a thesis in genetics. But somehow, I came across a textbook that contained this image of a chromosome from a salamander oocyte. It was made by an investigator by the name of William Dury E., and it showed a chromosome from an oocyte from a salamander being stretched between microneedles. I thought surely the scale marker was wrong, that the chromosome couldn't be this large. But this set me on a literature search, and I found that indeed giant chromosomes had been observed in the oocytes of frogs and salamanders as far back as the late 19th century. They had been given the quaint name of lamp brush chromosomes because of their imagined resemblance to the brushes used at that time for cleaning the soot from oil lamps. This has remained the name for these remarkable structures. Giant lamp brush chromosomes have been found in the oocytes of frogs and salamanders, and indeed in a variety of other organisms that have giant germ cells. Although not so well known as those from amphibians, lamp brush chromosomes are found in many birds, fishes, and even a few plant species. Most of my work has been done on the two species shown in this slide, the frog Xenopus and the salamander Ambistema. Here we see a bit of ovary from the frog Xenopus, showing oocytes of all different sizes from the very small transparent ones to the largest yolk filled ones, which reach the size of a millimeter or so in diameter. The, for those of you not familiar with animal reproduction, I remind you that despite their size, these are single cells with a single nucleus. This slide <clears throat> shows how easy it is to remove the giant nucleus by poking a hole in the oocyte and squeezing. The nucleus pops out often completely free of yolk, as in this example. This nucleus is almost always called the germinal vesicle, or GV, a term that actually goes all the way back to the early 19th century. It was first described from oocytes of the chicken, long before it was recognized as the nucleus, and even before the oocyte itself was recognized as a single giant cell. This slide <clears throat> shows the contents of a single GV of the frog Xenopus. At this stage of early meiosis, the maternal and paternal chromosomes are paired. That is, each nucleus contains the haploid number of paired chromosomes. I point out the numerous small bodies in the background, as we will come back to these a bit later. Here is a higher magnification image 
of a portion of one chromosome pair from the salamander Nodophthalmus. Nodophthalmus is also known as the newt and is a fairly common inhabitant of ponds and streams throughout eastern North America. Here you can see loops of chromatin extending laterally from the axis of the chromosome. Each of these loops represents a single active gene. It is a loop because it is covered with the ribonucleoprotein products of transcription. Here's a diagram of a Lambert chromosome structure. At the right is shown a single pair of loops, which represents an active gene covered with the products of transcription. Transcription begins at the thin end of the loop and continues all the way around the loop to the thick end. It should be noted that despite the size and prominence of the transcription unit, the transcription loops, most of the DNA of the chromosome is tightly wound up and is transcriptionally inactive. In addition to the Lambert chromosomes, each oocyte nucleus contains hundreds to thousands of small bodies of different types. The largest of these have been called nucleoli since the 19th century, although the relationship to the nucleus of ordinary somatic cells was not clear at all. To illustrate the extreme difference between the oocyte and a typical somatic cell, I show you an image taken from a classic paper by Barbara McClintock of the nucleolus of maize, or corn, if you prefer that name. Here, there is a single nucleolus attached to a specific point on one chromosome, the so-called nucleolus organizer region. What then is the relationship between the single nucleolus shown here and the hundreds of nucleoli in the amphibian oocyte? The answer to that question takes us to the earliest stages of the oocyte, long before the giant Lambert chromosomes are so prominent. At this time, we can see the chromosomes as thin fibers. On one side of the nucleus, however, is a large mass of chromatin, that is DNA plus protein. To make a long story short, what has happened here is that somehow the genes coding for ribosomal RNA have gotten out of the chromosome and replicated independently. They have formed a large mass on one side of the nucleus, consisting of thousands of copies of the genes coding for ribosomal RNA. This mass of DNA is referred to as amplified RDNA, or amplified ribosomal DNA. Here's another view of earlier sites <clears throat> from Xenopus, showing the stages of ribosomal DNA amplification in this case, the ribosomal DNA has been labeled with a radioactive tracer, shown here as black dots in the photographic emulsion that records the radioactive molecules. This technique of autoradiography would have been familiar to an earlier generation of cell biologists, but is much less commonly used nowadays. Another way to look at the amplified ribosomal genes is by electron microscopy. This image is, is a quite famous one produced by Oscar Miller and reproduced in numerous cell biology texts. It shows individual ribosomal RNA genes undergoing active transcription. The active transcriptions get longer and longer as they move down the gene, giving rise to these iconic Christmas trees. Most of the early studies on specific genes were carried out on the genes coding for ribosomal RNA. This was because these genes were present in hundreds to thousands of copies per nucleus. One other type of DNA was available for molecular analysis in those early days. This is the DNA known as satellite DNA. And this image of satellite DNA would have been familiar to an earlier generation of cell biologists whose only way to separate different fractions of DNA was by centrifugation. It turns out that about 10% of the DNA in the mouse genome 
has a different density from the rest of the DNA and can be separated by centrifugation, shown here as a satellite peak. When this satellite DNA was purified and used as a probe on cytological preparation, it was found to hybridize to the ends of the mouse chromosomes. Satellite DNA was found to consist of very simple sequences and essentially defines large regions of gene-free chromatin. It turned out that chromosomes of many organisms had regions of satellite DNA. Here is another well-known example from the fly, Drosophila virilis. Roughly half of each chromosome consists of simple sequence DNA that does not contain genes. Those are the large dark regions uh, occupying about half of each of the chromosomes. I want to make a digression here to look at the single cell organism Tetrahymena. For a period of about 10 years, starting in the early uh, 1980s, I turned my attention to Tetrahymena. It had been known for many years <coughs> that tetra Tetrahymena has two nuclei, a small genetic nucleus or micronucleus and a larger macronucleus that contains a massive amount of DNA. I was struck by the fact that the macronucleus had multiple nucleoli and in fact looked very much like the nucleus of an oocyte. To make a long story short, it turned out that the macronucleus of tetrahymena contains many thousands of copies of the genes coding for ribosomal RNA. These are present in multiple nucleoli on the periphery of the macronucleus, a situation very similar to that in the amphibian oocyte. When we isolated the ribosomal genes of tetrahymena, we found that they were in pairs located head to head. The tails turned out to be quite interesting. This slide shows the sequence uh, of the uh, tetrahymena and telomeres. They contain many copies of a repeated sequence as shown by Elizabeth Blackburn, at that time a postdoc in my lab. That sequence was C4A2 on one strand and G4T2 on the opposite. At that time, we did not know it, but later Liz Blackburn and her student Carol Greider found that this and similar sequences characterize the ends of chromosomes or telomeres in many other organisms. As many of you know, this finding led eventually to the Nobel Prize for Liz, Carol, and Jack Shasta. I want to come back to the journal of vesicle and the organelle, organelles that it contains. We already talked about the many free nucleoli that occur in the germinal vesicle. There are two other major bodies in the germinal vesicle, which we call the histone locus body and the speckle. The histone locus bodies get their name from the fact that one or two are attached to the Lambert chromosomes at a specific locus, in addition to the several hundred copies found free in the nucleoplasm. Here's a histone locus body with attached speckles shown by differential interference microscopy in the upper left image and after specific staining in the other three panels. The histone locus body contains the well-known protein named coilin as well as SM proteins associated with small nuclear RNAs. I want to close this presentation by briefly mentioning molecular studies on isolated germinal vesicles. As I showed earlier, we used isolated GVs for cytological studies of the chromosomes and nuclear organelles. We've also studied isolated GVs by molecular techniques, which I can only touch upon here today. This slide shows the isolation of the GV from the Xenopus oocyte and the removal of the nuclear envelope to give a fraction of pure nuclear RNA. One of the surprising studies 
one of the surprising findings from studies of isolated GVs is the occurrence of stable intronic sequences derived from splicing of many genes. These intronic sequences are found not only in the nucleus where they are formed, but in the cytoplasm. At the moment, we have no good hypothesis for the occurrence of these sequences. I wanted to close on something we know very little about to emphasize that the oocyte contains many secrets and that we can expect many surprises as we continue to oocyte its wonderful chromosomes and the many molecular processes occurring in it. And that ends my slide presentation.